Hi, Lydia. Hi. You were born and raised at Falls Village? I, well, technically was born in Torrington, but uh, yeah, I was raised here in Falls Village. Raised here. Can you uh, tell us about some of your favorite memories growing up in Falls Village? Mm, sure. Um, well, I, we had a really big yard where I grew up, like um, by the South Canada Meeting House, and my brother and I spent a lot of time back in the woods, you know, exploring, running around, um, swimming in the river back there, climbing the apple trees in our backyard, um, a lot of outdoor stuff that I, was really fun. A lot of my friends, a couple of them lived within walking distance, so we could always meet up and hang out pretty easily. Um, I don't know, just stuff. <laughs> Marine Maritime Archaeology. Mm -hmm. What, uh, how did you get interested in that? So my path to uh, what I'm currently doing is uh, kind of a weird one. So I did my undergrad. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And so I did a semester at UConn Torrington. And I just got some like general, like, requirements out of the way while I was there and then I ended up taking a semester off and I, I worked and then I needed to decide what I was actually going to do and focus on for school um, and so I put a lot of my hobbies into a Google search so I looked up things like travel, history, art, uh, outdoors, and the Society of the Historical Archaeologists was the first thing that popped up in my Google search. So I clicked on the links and I was like, okay, I'm going to study that. And no kidding. So I went and I did my undergrad at UMass Boston and I got my BA in Archaeology and History. And then um, while I was at UMass Boston, there, I learned about the um, SHA conference, which is Society of Historical and Underwater Archaeologists, and um, they have this whole section of the conference that is devoted to underwater archaeology, and it, like, I was just so interested in it. So I, after I graduated, I took a year and a half off and I looked up programs for masters in underwater archaeology and there are three in the US and I did some research into their curriculum and stuff and I decided that East Carolina University had the best program for me so I applied to that and it was the only one I applied to so I was pretty lucky that I got in and that's what I'm doing now. about the underwater aspect just was really intriguing to me and I had no experience scuba diving at all so I got accepted and I was like oh boy now I have to get a scuba certification but of course of course it was right in the beginning of COVID so I was all the scuba certification places and dive shops were shut down and I uh, found one guy in Bristol who was uh, he taught me and I was like the only person in the class and I did a lot of my dives in his neighbor's four foot deep above ground pool and I got certified that way um, and just kind of jumped in fully into this with not a lot of prior knowledge but it worked out well so. <laughs>
not just looking at objects, so especially in our field school in the summer, we did a lot of talking with locals, because um, they know the history better than anybody, you know, in that area. So you learn their relationship to the area and to the sites that you're looking at. Um, especially with the town that we were looking at that was mostly demolished, a lot of the people who live there now, it was their parents and their grandparents who had lived there, because uh, everybody left in the early 1900s. So it's, the history is still very much alive, and you can take these oral histories and talk to people. You go to historical societies, local museums, and so you get a lot of the culture, not just the, the objects, like the, you know. What else? Um, well, I can tell you about my thesis, if you want. Your thesis? Sure. Yeah. Most of the people in my program are focusing on shipwrecks for the theses. Um, some of them are looking at um, like maritime landscapes and uh, it's kind of how those have changed. But for my thesis, I am working with indigenous communities. program I wanted to work um, with Native peoples and help them kind of find ways to tell their own history because I did a lot of that in my undergrad and so I wanted to continue that in my master's just with the underwater element to it so I reached out to the um, state archaeologist in North Carolina and I asked them if they had anything that would kind of fit into that and so they pointed me towards the Kohari tribe which is one of eight state recognized tribes in North Carolina and there was a dugout canoe that was rediscovered in 2018 and was repatriated so it was like given back to the tribe uh, in 2019 and they now have it on display in their um, in the Kohari Tribal Center and the canoe is 650 years old and it's in amazing condition so for my thesis, I am doing an art, what's called an artifact biography. So basically, it tells the whole story, the life cycle of an artifact. In this case, the canoe. Um, so it's from its creation and then its uses, its abandonment, rediscovery, and preservation, conservation, and then like exhibition of it. So or wherever it ends up. Um, so a lot of this, I. I don't have much for the early history of the canoe since there's no written documentation, um, but we generally know how these canoes were made and used, so I can kind of give the, like, this is probably how it would have been utilized, but then I have very documented history of its rediscovery and how its journey since it was found, re-found, re I guess, um, and what it, so I'm interviewing tribal members and, and talking about what it means to them and the significance it holds for the tribe, what it means spiritually for them to have it and how it kind of brings out more of the identity of people um, and things like that. So. And the name of the tribe again? The Kohari tribe. Kohari. Mm -hmm. K-O-H-A-R-E-I. C-O. Yep. H-A-R-E-I. Great. Good. Mm -hmm. So what are you, what are you going to do when you graduate? Um, so ideally I'd like to come back to New England and since my family's here, my friends are here, um, my boyfriend's here, <laughs> but um, so I'd like to come back up here and I'd either like to get a state or federal job, something that would offer benefits would be preferred, um, and I'd like to be a field archaeologist. kind of uh, project that's going on in central Massachusetts with the Nipmuc tribe who I actually worked with in my undergrad and they are um, in Grafton, Mass, kind of near Springfield and so they have some dugout canoes that are currently submerged in black water which is what we call water that you basically can't see in and I have lots of experience in black water which um, I wish I could have some clear water but you know it's fine. Um, and so I would, that would probably be ideal for me. It's only an hour and a half from here and 
Um, it's exactly what I am doing now with my thesis, and I could do it after my thesis. Going underwater in black water, I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, so we, we call, when you're diving, or like if you're conducting a, like archaeological investigation in black water, you have to do what we call archaeology by braille, which is basically you just feel your way along the shipwreck and try to map it as best as you can. You take measurements and, you know, if you're lucky, you might be able to see your tape measure in front of your face. Um, and then you always have a dive buddy, so you, you communicate by, like, different series or sequences of tugs on the tape measure, so you each have one end of it and you can, like, one pull is, like, I'm good, two pulls is move on, three pulls is go to the surface. Um, so you get really creative when you can't see or hear or talk to your buddy. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you're doing really technical things that take a lot of concentration because, you know, if you're in the water, you have to keep your body like hovering above the bottom because if you kneel on it, you could damage it. Um, although you usually end up kneeling on it anyway, just because you have like a underwater clipboard and a tape measure and a light and everything you're trying to juggle and it's um, it's hard. <laughs> but this program, make sure that you are good at it, you know? Yeah. But. School takes up a lot, a lot of time, but, um, you know, as they, like they say, if you enjoy what you do, you don't work a day in your life, and, like, this program in the field that I'm getting into is so much fun, and it's like you spend eight hours out on the boat or, like, diving or whatever, and it's exhausting, but it's also, like, you know, it's just, it's great, and it keeps you fit, and you're learning constantly, and... You know, you have good people around you, so it's really great. <laughs> good, good. You've traveled quite a bit around the world. Yeah, I spent two years living in Germany. So I did, uh, I graduated high school after three years. I kind of doubled up on classes and graduated early. And then I took a gap year and I lived in Germany. Um, and I went to art school there and found out that I did not want to be an artist. <laughs> it's so easy to go to other countries when you're in Europe. It's, so I think I've been to 10 or 12 countries over there. Um, and then also my family hosts exchange students. So we've had uh, 20 or 25 exchange students from all over the world. and. I've been able to visit them, so I, I was able to go to Colombia and visit our first exchange student, Javier. Uh, we visited him for Easter one year, which was really cool, because they celebrate Easter so differently from how we do. Um, so that was really fun. Um, I spent one day in Mexico, and I went to Canada for four days, and that's pretty much the extent of my travels. <laughs> but... Do you have any stories or anecdotes? about uh, your travels? Mm. Well, there was... I always like to think about this one time when I was in Prague. <laughs> um, we... It was like one of the... My second year living in Germany, my, my school took a trip to Prague for like three days. Um, it was... I don't know if it was spring break or something, but it was kind of like a mandatory field trip to Prague. Um, and they took us out on this like jazz cruise dinner thing down the river and then um, they like let us loose and we could do whatever we kind of wanted, like sightsee the city and whatever. Um, and so me and a couple friends went into this bar and we were like looking around and we sat at a table and realized that we were surrounded by all of these guys who were like in their early to mid 20s, like very fit and we were the only women in this room and we're like this is kind of weird and so then like the guys were like oh they need a bottle of wine and so they bought us a bottle of wine and then we found out that they were uh this were they yeah the Swiss or no, they might have, I don't remember I think they were the, the Swiss hockey champions and they were celebrating being the champions and so they'd all come to Prague and 
So they were just like having a really great time and they bought us like these bottles of wine and then there was a piano in the bar and so me and one of the hockey players like did a duet on the piano and then all of us like were, we left the bar and we are just walking down the street and like singing songs and I don't know, it was just, like a, a fun night. And, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Prague is a pretty big city. Prague is an awesome city. It has, you know, the when the city was originally built in like the 1100s, well, I don't know if it was originally built, but some of the oldest structures still standing in Prague are from the 1100s, and they were like low in the floodplain, and so the river that goes through Prague would flood it all the time. So then they just built modern Prague on top of old Prague, and to, so that it wouldn't flood anymore and some of those old buildings are still accessible and they're through like these little tiny doorways that are like angled down and you have to crouch to go in them and we got tours of these really cool old like old they, they I mean they looked underground although originally they weren't underground but um, like stone stone houses and stuff and that was really really cool one morning I got up at you know, 4 or 4.30 and I walked across the city and then up it was kind of a little mountain on the edge of the city and I watched the sunrise and that was really cool. Uh, do you hope to settle down in Falls Village or have the big cities captured your imagination? I, I prefer a small town. I mean, I've, I've having grown up in Falls Village, but I've also lived, I lived for two and a half years in Boston and I lived for a year in Berlin. And so I've lived in large metropolitan areas, and I think I prefer the smaller, like, woodsy settings. Um, but as far as whatever job I can get, I think I'm just going to have to go with uh, whatever whatever I can get, you know. But also, you know, my, my boyfriend, he uh, makes, he's hoping to, uh, to start, a, like, a, a hard cider business, so anywhere he could have an orchard is something that's also on the mind, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, as as things, as jobs kind of make themselves available, and then you, you talk it out, you compromise, you come up with a plan, and then you decide. But I have nothing that's really specific that I'm looking for right now. Is there anything you want to add to it? I don't know. Is there anything else that would be helpful? <laughs> anything would be helpful. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Am I all that interesting? <laughs> yes. Yes, you um, are. I don't know. I, I like to see more women in STEM, so encourage more girls to, to get into science fields. <laughs> science, engineering. Science, te technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh-huh. Do you have a picture of the canoe that you're doing? Yeah. I can also send you, I don't think I have your email, but I have, a, I created a photogrammetry model, which is a, a 3D kind of um, image of it. But you, I went and I took 177 photos of the canoe and then I put them through a software that, um, kind of aligns the photos and then it it like meshes them all together and adds texture and then you can add this animation that like rotates it and you can get a 3D rotating image of the canoe that looks like the real thing, you know. Well, good. Thank you so much, Lydia. Yeah. This has been nice. I hope you got some good stuff. <laughs> I think so.